can wash away my sin, nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me hold again? Nothing but the blood. Oh, precious is that flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. 24 messages we've been working on this theme. We move now to the blood, part five. Now that we've seen the truth about the law, the truth about sin, the truth about sacrifice, the truth about scapegoating, Myers feels that the next two chapters are almost unnecessary because once we understand that sin is basically violence and everything that leads to violence and that the law and sacrifice don't rescue us from sin but only lead us deeper into it, and that scapegoating is the only human practice which creates a temporary reprieve from human violence, even though scapegoating itself is the greatest and most foundational human sin of all. We can then see how the blood of Jesus rescues us from sin as nothing else can. I just want to thank you all for walking with me out here off the beaten path where we are have been lost for about 24 messages. I'm figuring tonight you might get found, I don't know. I ought to start to make some kind of sense here. And I'm talking about biblical sense. But the blood of Jesus rescues from sin by revealing the truth to us. This is a different perspective than the traditional understanding that Jesus' blood is the sacrifice for sin. And remember, those of y'all who just want to be fideistic, just, just go ahead and do that. I'm not, I'm not trying to make somebody change into something else. But I'm just trying to help you understand how God can be looked at from a different perspective. And that if you don't do that, it's going to be difficult to have a relationship with a God who you believe is angry and vindictive and cruel. And so we want to look and see what he says in the text. So Jesus' death on the cross reveals the truth about sin. That sin is basically violence and everything that leads to violence. And that's the prehistory of the, of the whole Bible in Genesis 1 through 11. Then it reveals the truth about the law and sacrifice. It is humans who require a sacrifice, not Jesus, not God. Uh, he didn't ask for a sacrifice, but we believe that. That's all we've been taught. But we're learning something else, amen? It reveals the foundational truth about scapegoating, that it is the human mechanism for bringing about an illusion for peace. We feel a lot better and a lot closer and a lot more peaceful when we kill a few folks. And I feel better, so much better, since I killed my neighbor down. So I feel a little bit better, but it's an illusion. It's not real peace. And it reveals the truth about the heart of God and the heart of mankind. We're going to be going into that in several different ways to try to further elucidate what we've been talking about. And it reveals the cross reveals that through his violent, lawful, sacrificial, scapegoating death on the cross, Jesus is trying to show us a better way, a better way to reach peace. And so, believe it or not, we have reached, excuse me, I have reached chapter 10. Now, some of y'all ain't read nothing, but I have reached chapter 10. We explain how Jesus shows a better way to peace. And chapter 11, we'll look at several key texts from the Bible which clearly unveil the truth about the blood of Jesus. So in chapter 10, he takes up defining blood. You know, you must, God must have called you to this church, and he must want you to be here, because that's the only way you can sit and listen to this kind of stuff. Because all you want to hear is the stuff you know, so you can amen your arrogance and say amen, amen. Now you got to sit there and go, I don't know about that. Uh, <laughs> makes it a little more difficult. But we are learning, amen? amen. We want to grow in God. Amen. We want to mature in God. Amen. Defining blood. Everybody knows that blood is the liquid that gives us life. Amen. But what we want to look at is the symbolism of the term blood in the Bible and in history. So we, as we will see, a lot of the scriptural references to blood refer to concepts already discussed in the book, such as sinful shedding of blood through religious violence that comes from the law through holy wars and through sacri sacred sacrifice, and the entire scapegoating process 
in which blood is shed in the pursuit of peace. But therefore, by way of defining blood in this chapter, all of these concepts are going to be considered again. And in the process, we're going to see how the blood of Jesus rescues and delivers us from sin. It, it is the blood. Yes. Now, it's a different way than you've been looking at the blood, but it is the blood. And the blood is, will never lose its power. So let's talk about bloody sin. In biblical literature and theology, blood is often associated with violence. And we'll find phrases like bloodshed and the spilling of blood. These terms are close synonyms for murder and for warfare. Uh, one of the reasons I think that we don't really want to talk about this is that we, we really don't want to identify how violent we are. Um, as long as we were talking about, you know, God is violent and he wants Jesus dead, we, we like that. But when we start talking about we're violent and we're the one that wants Jesus dead, that's a... So these terms are close synonyms. And in addition to the liquid that runs through your vein, blood can also be a shorthand for bloodshed. When used in reference to bloodshed, the word blood is referring to the violent events like sacrifice, war, death, murder, and we're going to get to some of those scriptures and read some of them right now. I'm just trying to set the basis so we can go forward. So whenever we read about blood in the Bible, it's helpful to pause and consider whether the reference is to physical blood or to violent imagery instead. When you read the Bible in this way, we find out that most of the references to blood in the Bible are really about violence. Therefore, violence is the main concept that blood symbolizes. And that's all new because we think about blood and we're just thinking about the literal blood of Jesus. But that's not what the text is talking about, you'll see. In part one of this book, we learned that violence it's also the main concept behind sin. When we think of sin, we think of maybe breaking some law or doing something wrong. But in the first 11 chapters, that sin is violence. And we learn that sin and violence and the things that lead to violence. And since blood also leads to violence, this means that sin, blood, and violence are all connected. Sin leads to bloodshed. Bloodshed is a sign of sin. Both come from violence and they lead to greater violence. So this relationship is especially true when the New Testament speaks about the blood of Jesus. And almost every time the New Testament speaks about the blood of Jesus, it has in view the way his life was violently taken on the cross. To speak of Jesus' blood is not merely to speak of his physical blood being poured out, but to speak of his violent death. And references to the blood of Jesus point to his sacrificial, bloody death on a Roman cross. And this shows that the crucifixion of Jesus was the greatest sin humanity ever created, ever did. What was the worst sin? We killed God. We crucified the Son of God. Jesus' death was not to appease the wrath of God. For how can another death bring pleasure to a God who's against all violent deaths? The crucifixion of Jesus was the greatest human sin in a line of sin that stretches all the way back to the beginning of human history and the beginning of violence. So Jesus' death does not appease the wrath of God because God was never angry to begin with. We want him to be angry. We need him to be angry, but he wasn't angry. Rather, the crucifixion, and we already showed that, right? Hello? We looked at... The fact that when Adam and Eve sinned, and we're going to go into it again because it's hard to get there, God didn't say, I'm so angry with y'all, I don't know what to do. But he showed up and said, where are you? It's time for our walk. That don't sound angry to me. But we read it into the text because of what we've been taught. So rather than the crucifixion, and revealed the violence in the heart of humanity rather than in the heart of God. And that is called the anthropology of the cross. The the let's, let's get these shorthand terms so I could talk more easily. The theology of the cross tells how God used Jesus' death to save us. The anthropology of the cross reveals the violence in human hearts. The theology of the cross reveals what God was doing to save us. The anthropology reveals just how violent we are when what we did to Jesus Christ on the cross. 
Remember, most of you don't feel anything I'm talking about right now because you've never killed anybody with a gun. You've done it plenty of times with your mouth. But you know, that doesn't count. So we're not thinking about it in those terms. So his death calls for us to forsake violent ways and follow Jesus instead into love and forgiveness. Now that, that's, that's hard stuff. I mean, when people doing stuff to you and, and you don't think it's right and you don't like it, uh, you, you want to fight. You don't be talking about no love and forgiveness. Now, you might recommend that for some other people who, you know, I don't know what's wrong with you, but when it's your turn, um, you going all the way back to your switchblade days. I mean, you're going back, like, I, you, you, you don't, because I, I heard some of y'all, I've seen some of y'all in here, you know, when you went in there, you didn't know I was watching you, you know, you know, you don't, you don't know me, you know, you don't know who you're dealing with, well, wait a minute now, you're, you're a Christian, I sh should know who I'm dealing with, well, I ain't been saved all my life, okay, 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 so you're warning me, okay, just want you to know. So Jesus' death was necessary, but not for God. It was necessary for us. There's no way for Jesus to reveal the violence of humanity except by submitting himself to that violence. In order to show us how violent we were, he had to submit himself to the violence so that we could see it. And remember, Gerard, we are never more blind than when we are doing violence in the name of God. So very seldom did we stop mid-sentence and say, you know what? That was a violent thing to say. I shouldn't have said that. I should be loving and forgiving. No, we, don't. we just keep right on going. And our friends join us. They don't stop you and say, you know what? You shouldn't say that. We just say, shoot me too. I understand. You know, in grief recovery, we're taught to relate. I can relate. I'm going to relate on violence. So Jesus had to die violently at the hands of people to reveal the scapegoat mechanism. So the fact that he had to die doesn't mean he had to die because God wanted him to die. But in order to reveal the mechanism, he needed to die. And Jesus' blood reveals the human violence is the central component to sin. So let's go on and talk about bloody law. Blood also reveals that the religious law only leads to more sin and more violence. Now, if you haven't been here, we covered this. Now, this is the, this is the 25th message. Okay, I'm just plodding along. And we've talked about it, and I know some of it you didn't get, but there is a book out there if you want to read it. Uh, we saw that in part two. The law was given because of a true relationship built on love was rejected by the Israelites. I'm going to try to help you understand that it's going to be di very difficult. But if you have love, you don't need the law. The law came because there was no love. And you can only have society by law because we won't operate by love. If there was love, there would be no need for the law. And so society is based upon the law, which keeps the, the, uh, the society functioning. So we have traffic lights so that we can exist and function. If we had love, we would know better than go speeding through the intersection. Because we know we could kill somebody. But we, since we don't have love, we're not operating by love. Law came in its place. And I'm going to show you how law operates later on. So in the absence of love, law curbed violence and limited retaliation. Prior to the law, violent sin and bloodshed quickly escalated out of control and became a contagion of violence that threatened to destroy the entire civilization and all cultures. That is, we're in anthropology now talking about how anthropologists believe the world came into being and we almost destroyed ourselves. Gerard called this mimetic contagion when the crowd gets going and we start going back and forth. And you know, in mimetic contagion or, or crowd kind of stuff, do you know that psychologically the crowd can do some stuff, not even know they do it, walk away and not know why they did it? Crowds. So be careful about crowds. Uh, they, you can get caught up and next thing you know, I mean kill folks and walk away and they say, so why did you do that? I don't know. 
Just like what happens when, if it's a fire or something like that, people will start running that don't even know what they're running from. Because of that mimetic contagion, how it, how it catches on. But the law limits revenge. It limits retaliation. And so, praise God for the law, even though that's not love. The law means that many of us will make it because you're not going to shoot me. And the reason you're not going to shoot me is not because you love me, but because you don't want to go to jail. So therefore, the law is a curb. The law stops some stuff where love should have done, stopped it. And so at the same time, the law also leads to more human violence and bloodshed because the law allows violence then to be sacred. Since I can't shoot you, I'm, we're going to pick somebody we can shoot. And then we're going to command it and commend it by God and put it in his name. So we're going to sanctify violence, sanctify sin. And it makes the sin of violent bloodshed something to be sought after, to be rejoiced in, to be celebrated. Consequently, violence can be rationalized as the just and justified as God's divine punishment on others. I mean, don't, don't it feel good? Some, are are y'all listening to me? I mean, don't it feel good sometimes to just look at people and say, boy, God is getting you, ain't he? Come on, somebody. Help me out. Help me out. Y'all ain't saying nothing over here. Y'all all right? Okay. I mean, sometimes it just feel good to say, you know, you know don't worry. God's going to get them. Yeah, that's God. He, he working now. They had an automobile accident. Why? Because the way they talked to me last Sunday. It just feel good to blame it on God and to say God is... He's working some stuff out over there. Now, it's really funny. He don't ever work no stuff out on you. He only work it out on other folks. So this allows us, uh, it allows war and allows us to go to war and to create holy war. And we can march off to war with the prayers of our pastor supporting death in God's name. And when they dropped those two bombs on the Japanese people, there were pastors who blessed them before they dropped them. Now that's incongruent to me. It's inconceivable that anybody would bless a bomb. But when you think about the violence of humanity, it, it ought to begin, begin to make some more sense. So the shed blood of Jesus on the cross allows us to see the reliance on the law leads to using the law to kill and murder others in the name of God. Are y'all hearing me? I'm almost done. I mean, I'm, I'm taking these real, you want to know why we're getting out so early. This is so heavy, ain't no use in taking an hour talking about it. We need to talk about it for about 10 minutes and just go on about your business. Because you're going to have to, the Lord's going to have to reveal it and you got to go home and think about it and work it through if you're going to change. Now, if you're not going to change, you know, you used to be spending all my time about with that either because you ain't going to change. So why spend all that time? Bloody sacrifices. The law also provided the means by which an animal could be killed instead of a human being. So we're talking about anthropology. We're talking about that people start, at least the, the, the anthropologists believe, that at first they were offering human beings. They were killing human beings in the name of God. After a while, they start killing animals. And then eventually, it became a ritual. And so human revenge and retaliation often led to more and greater human death. But the law allowed the substitute of animal victims for human victims. And yet, that doesn't mean that animal sacrifice is good. While shedding the blood of an animal might be better than shedding the blood of a human being, violence against animals is still unnecessary violence. Remember, and you got to go all the way back. This is kind of review tonight because we're getting ready to jump into the blood. That there are three types of sacrifices, sociological, psychological, and spiritual. Now, there are some days, how many of y'all went to school? There are some days when you come back and the teacher starts reviewing, you don't know what the teacher's talking about. This is one of those days. Is that 
psychological. We went through that, but you probably don't remember it because people have a tendency when stuff is tough to check out. You know, I just check out. I, I don't know what he's talking about. Well, stay tuned. Stick in there. The more you'll get a little bit more, a little bit, a little bit more. After a while, a light bulb's going to come on, and God will reveal it to you. But you got to stay in there. Sometimes, particularly in our church, people come, and some of the members tell me, we got members or other folks that are visiting, and they just law. I, I don't know what he's talking about. And I, well, just sit there and pay attention. After a while, it might, the Lord might reveal it to you. How many of y'all go to the movies? Well, what is this? That mean you don't go? Or do you go? What does that mean? I don't know what this means. How many of you go to the movie? Oh, okay, good. Almost everybody. Um, when you go to the movie, are there some parts you don't understand? And what do you do? Get up and leave, right? You ain't leaving. I know I'm not leaving. When that went out and invested $30, I'm sitting there with popcorn and I done spent my money. I'm just going to have to see this through. Members come in and folks is cussing. I look at them. And I should leave. But I got too much money invested here. I can't, I can't go right now. So you don't get up and leave when the movie, when you don't understand the movie, you do what? You, you, you press in a little bit more. Well, I wonder what's going on. And then sometimes you'll talk to the person next to you. Say, what, what happened? What happened? Did you see what happened? Like, we well, need to do that at church. He said, what did he say? What did Bishop say? I missed something there. What happened? Don't just sit there dumb. <laughs> Try to figure out what's going on. What did he say? I don't know. What did I, what did I miss there? Because there's something happening that he said because everybody's shouting and I didn't get it. So you got to press in so you get it. So that's why I try to help y'all. You need to go to bed on Saturday night or else you won't be in good place to be able to listen to that deep stuff I'm going to be pouring out on Sunday morning. When you come home from church on Wednesday night, you need to go in, freshen yourself a little bit, get you a little something to eat, whatever, get ready so that we're getting ready to study and press in. And some of it is not so much study that I don't understand it intellectually. It is a spiritual revelation. And I got to press in spiritually and open my heart. And I'm so messed up by what happened at work, I can't even get there. I done had to cuss three people out at work today. And here come Bishop talking about the blood. I think I'm going to shed some blood. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm messed up. Now we got to come to church. To come to church, you need to prepare yourself. All right, I got to go. I said sociological, psychological, spiritual. Sociologically, sacrifice brought about apparent peace. Psychologically, sacrifices address the guilt of humanity. And finally, there was a spiritual purpose for sacrifice and will in that sin was viewed as a contaminating substance which covered and defiled everything it came into contact with, sort of how we view bacteria. When you read the Old Testament, that's the concept. You don't understand it because you got a modern Western view of sin. Somebody done done something or, or in the Old Testament, they look at it like bacteria. Don't get too close to me because it can get on me. I don't want to get sick. And blood was used to cleanse items and wash away sin the way we use Lysol. The blood takes care of. It washes away. It gets rid of stuff. And in all three types of sacrifices, the blood of the victim is shed in an attempt to stop the escalation of violence in the family, in the town, in the community. It's getting worse and worse. So instead of everybody being all against, in, in anthropology, it's called all against all, let's just kill one person. And that's how y'all do it. They used to all of us fighting. Let's just kill Sister Hookfin. That'll take care of it. We'll all feel better. We'll have some peace. And then we can move on. But the problem is it won't last. 
Bloodshed is an attempt to stop more bloodshed, but even more blood than is shed in the name of God. And even though bloodshed achieves a temporary peace, God does not want or need the sacrifice. That's probably the hardest thing you've been here have to hear me say, isn't it? Because you know God want it because he sent him to die. I don't know if he sent him to die. I think he sent him on a mission. I thought he sent him so that it might undo the works of the devil. I thought he sent him so that you might have life and have it more abundant. I'm just talking about what the Bible said. I thought he said it for all those reasons. It doesn't say any place that he sent him to die. I don't think it says that anywhere in the Bible directly. But we, uh, we uh, assume it through various pa passages, which some of them I've already touched on. So, God doesn't need the sacrifice. Well, who needs the sacrifice? I do. I need the sacrifice. I want the sacrifice. God accepts humanity where it is so that he can lead us towards love and forgiveness. But I really don't like love and forgiveness. I really enjoy killing people. Okay? So, I, I mean, I, I'm waiting on y'all to say amen. amen. That may never happen tonight. But I'm just waiting on you to say you like to kill people. You enjoy it. Why y'all looking at me like that? Just tell the truth. Can you just go think back right now? Have there been any people that you really enjoy just putting a stick in? Just knifing them a couple of times. Huh? I guess I'm the only honest person in here. The rest of y'all are not going to admit that you done killed I don't know how many people over your lifetime with your mouth. Just knifed them, killed them, walked away, and felt good about it. Because it was in the name of God. It was in the name of God now that you did it. Okay? So, the more you read the Bible, the more you will see, if you read it carefully, that God doesn't seem to want any sacrifices. He accepts them, but he doesn't seem to want them. He tells them, you know, these things aren't going to work stuff. I, I, I'm not looking for blood. I'm not looking for sacrifice. I don't need, he says it right out in the text, but we still say, but that's what you want, though. He said, I don't want it. Human sacrifice, I'm not looking for. I'm looking for your heart. I'm looking for a change. Again and again, the author states that Jesus submitted himself to the cross, not to please God, but to reveal the violence of humanity and to clear the name of God. And so, let's talk about bloody scapegoating, and you can get on your way. Since scapegoating is so important, there's so much to remember, the author at this point summarizes the scapegoat mechanism. The scapegoat mechanism is the anthropological perspective of how uh, society developed. And so, here is what he, told, what he told us in a shorthand. Number one, human beings are imitative. Human beings imitate what they see others do, and they Im even imitate others' desire. This is basic, it's human, it's an instinctive learning pattern. Humans are imitative. How many of you know that? I, I, I could show it to you even at this church, how imitative humans are, without even knowing it, without even looking at it. Back over the course of our 45 years of preaching and ministry here at this church, I have had various hairstyles. <laughs> the other day when I was sitting in the, uh, in, in the conference room and somebody was in there, we were dealing, they said, I was just looking at these pictures because there's one I got a flat top and there's one I got a curl. And so you have those different styles. And I can tell you that each time I change my style, the church changed its style. I know you wouldn't believe it. I'm just telling you. We started out with the flat top. And everybody was flat topping. Okay. Yeah. You know, candy. You know, they was flat topping. Everybody did. Then I got the curl and all of a sudden everybody started curling. Okay. And then when I got tired of that, I went to this. And this guy started cutting the hair off. We are imitative. Not only of the people, but of what they have, what their desires are. 
I start buying a certain kind of car. <laughs> if you got the money. We imitate. It's a major way of learning. Mirror neurons say that a two-hour-old a, a two baby, if you bend over the bassinet and make a face, the baby will make a face back the way you're created to learn and you don't know it so when you whoever you interact with uh, and, and, uh, and in, anybody you interact with whether you know it or not you're learning something from them they're learning something from you so to be careful who you interact with the Bible would put it this way bad communication corrupts good manners number two I'm trying to get done but y'all ain't saying amen so that make me go long Imitation leads to rivalry and violence. When there is a limited supply or a perceived limited supply of something, it creates competition and rivalry. We want the same things that others want. So I can get up here and I can preach all I want. I can preach the horns off a of billy goat that you don't need to be in rivalry with anybody else. You don't need to worry about leadership. You don't need to worry about titles. But when there is rivalry for a certain kind of acknowledgement and title, it's going to come about in the church, even though I'm preaching the opposite. Because people ain't doing what I'm preaching. They're doing and imitating what they see. Should I just go on or? So imitation is very powerful in how it takes place. And sometimes, this is why the sermon I preached at the Joint College of Bishops was so hot and I'm preaching in other places, writing a book on it, because sometimes you, you want the same thing. After a while, you begin to compete for the same thing for, and you want to be the person that you're looking at. I'm going to try to be them. I want them. And you can't be them because there's no way they can ontologically give you themselves. So therefore, you want to destroy them. Feeling if I could get rid of them, maybe I could get what they got. I think that's Cain and Abel, I think it was. Killing me won't get you what you're trying to get. Because you can't grasp what can only be given as a gift. You can't take you can't take what can only come as a gift. After some suffering, after some growth, after some maturity. So you, you, you want my glory, but you don't want my story. I, I, want, I want what you got, but I don't want to go through what you went through to get it. I, I'm, not, I'm not getting no traction in here tonight. So let me go ahead and get on up out of here. Number three, so violence then threatens to destroy us all. Now remember that when we were talking about how society developed, if they are correct, they would be fighting over um, elephant bones. So they wouldn't be fighting just to be fighting. They'd be fighting for food. They'd be fighting for survival. And in many ways, we're fighting for survival. But it's psychological survival. It's emotional survival. And we don't know that we're doing that. So violence threatens to destroy us all. The violence that springs from rivalry escalates until it threatens to consume culture. So it, it kept getting growing and growing, and the violence gets bigger and bigger because we set ourselves against one another. And I told you how that worked. You know, all y'all from the hood, y'all know, y'all understand how that works. You some start to fight, and you just say, wait right here, I'm going to go get my brother. And you, you go get your brother, bring him back. And they say, wait right here, I'm going to get my uncle. So, you know, you know. They'll get their uncle, bring them back. They'll say, wait right here, I'm going to get my gun. Okay, so, so it just keeps escalating. And now you've got two families, the Hatfields and the McCoys, and they're fighting it out. And so in order to stop that, violence is cured through the scapegoat mechanism. Two people or parties end their conflict by blaming a third party. The scapegoat is accused, is cast out, maybe even killed, and it brings an apparent peace. And this apparent peace reinforces the belief that the scapegoat was guilty of the crimes by which they were charged. So we just make them guilty. They got to be guilty. Uh, so we kill them. And, and we know there's bring kind of a peace here. So that must have been right. That must have been what we should have done. Man, it must have even been God. You know how we make stuff God. 
You know how we make stuff God? Yes. I was talking to and doing some counseling, trying to help people understand that, you know, a, a person understand that, you know, we, they said, how, I want to hear God. I said, well, I don't think you're going to be able to hear God where you are right now. When your desire becomes so volatile and so fervent, it's tough to hear God. And after a while, you begin to insinuate God into the stuff that you think is going on. It must be God. Like I, I told you about that last week before last, didn't I? You know how you go out there and say, God, if it's your will to get this car, I need $1,000 off. And it's 900 and you say, oh, look at God. <laughs> well, you just made it 1000 We're just going to make it 1000 That's close enough, ain't it? I could, I could tell you some situations in my life where I thought God was saying something to me because I wanted it so badly. I'll be reading in the Bible. I see God speaking to me and saying different things. And then you start getting into numerology. Ooh. I read this morning that said five. <laughs> and I was reading last night, the number five came up. And when I was at the dealer, he said, I'll give you five more dollars off. <laughs> uh, I, I, feel, I, I feel it. I mean, I'm feeling the five. Woo. Oh, oh, blah, 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 blah. Oh, glory. So we're going we gonna to turn it into God. Because that's what we want. And then people will come and when they drop that card on you, that's, that's the trump card. They might as well do like we used to do when we were playing uh, Tonk in the office. They get, my, get up on the table with the card. This, this is the trump card here. This is it. When I lay this down, it's, it's all over. And when you come to me and say, well, you know, I believe God said, well, what you want me to say? I can't say nothing to that. What you should come and say is pray with me that God will be. No, no, I believe God doesn't show me. What am I going to say? God didn't show you? I'm not going to say that. That puts me in trouble. You saying what he told you. I'm not going to tell you what he told you or didn't tell you. I wasn't there in the dream. So I can't, I can't say anything. So I, j I just have to stand there. Now, I could say something, but then you would use it against me. I could just tell you, no, I don't believe that's God. And then you will go away and talk about me all over the church. I tried to tell the bishop what God said. He going to tell me. That wasn't God. Like he know what God done told me. I know what God told me. Sister Beecham, are you, are you understanding this? Okay. Okay. They don't put my name out there. And they're not going to come back later on when they found out that it wasn't God. And say, you know what? Bishop was right. No, no, no. That ain't going to never happen. So, <laughs> let's go. Sacrifice repeats the scapegoat mechanism. So what happens is violence is cured. It, it seemed to be cured. And then it works. So people notice that the offering seems to create peace, even though it's usually an unconscious process. But the event becomes a cycle. The cycle becomes a tradition. They say it worked last time. Let's offer up somebody else to make sure that we don't, you know, come back. We handle that. So we offered, when was that? When was that? Last May? Well, we offered up Sister Hook for him, remember? We killed her. And it was a lot of peace. Let's find us another one. Offer up so we don't have that problem. We don't even wait. We're not going to even wait. Let's just do it every year. And then the entire system becomes supported by religion. Due to the almost mystical nature of the apparent peace, people attribute the whole process to God. So the process becomes a religious ritual. And we don't even know why we're doing it anymore. We don't even know why we're, we just know it's May, time to offer somebody up. We don't know why. We don't know what happened before. It just becomes a ritual. Seven, Jesus came to unveil the entire process and put an end to it. <laughs> through his life, through his teaching, through his ministry, through his death, through his resurrection, he reveals the truth. What's the truth? 
he never scapegoats anyone. He allows himself to be scapegoated. But he won't scapegoat anybody else. Now that's a hard thing because when people are scapegoating you, the imitative process, the, 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 the magnetic rivalry says, I'm going to do the same thing to you you're doing to me. And I feel good about it. So you, they, they cussed you out. Yeah, they cussed you out, but you, you should have heard what I said to them. You know, I got them straight. So they were violent towards you, you imitated the violence in the name of God, and you think that's right. I killed every amen in here now, honey, because that's what we do. But Jesus wouldn't do it. He became the scapegoat in order to demonstrate that scapegoats are usually not guilty of what people are accusing them of, and then submitted himself to the mechanism to show a different way, love and forgiveness. If you show love and forgiveness in this society, people believe that you are a fool. There must be something wrong with you. Why would you let them do that to you? Why would you let people treat you that way? Why would you let people step on you? Why would you? Why would you? Because I'm operating and I'm walking in the footsteps of Jesus. And walking in the footsteps of Jesus, I can stop the violent mechanism and might be able to lead somebody into the way of Jesus Christ. But I'm not going to do that killing folks and acting like the devil. So we'll keep talking. And how how y'all doing? Y'all doing all right? We'll keep talking. We'll keep working. After a while, some of this is going to make some sense. You're going to say, I'm talking about biblical sense. You're going to say, mm, that's a different way to look at it. And then if you don't like it, you just go on back to your fideistic ways. And it's okay. Fideism is, comes from the word fidelity, semper fi, uh, always faithful. You're faithful to what you believe. You don't want to hear nothing else, even whether it's true or not true. I just like where I am. And some people are like that. Remember, people like comfortability. So they want to stay where they are. They feel comfortable. They want to come. Some of y'all come in here, you sit in the same seat. So, Huh? Comfortability. Somebody sitting in your seat, you just give them a couple of quick glances. To let them know you are in my seat. And I cannot praise God from row three, seat five. I cannot. I can only praise God in row two, seat ten. That's where God comes to earth for me. And you're sitting in my seat. Mimetic rivalry. I got to be that seat. Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you that you did not follow in our footsteps, but you set out a whole new path whereby you gave your life so that we might have a model of how to love and operate in forgiveness. I thank you that you entered into death to rescue us so that we might be saved. Thank you that when we were violent and when we were trying to put you to death, you didn't fight, but you yielded your arms and hands to, to the process and you were crucified. And you said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And then after, Lord, you set up the whole church with disciples who failed you and walked away from you. What a mighty God you are. You're a prayer-answering God. You're a forgiving God. You're a merciful God. And I want to thank you tonight that even though I'm a murderer, you have chosen to use me. Even though I kill people, you've chosen to use me. Even though there's murder and violence in my heart, you've chosen to use me and to continue to help me mature and grow towards the image of your son, Jesus Christ. So thank you tonight. And we ask you to reveal these things to us more and more through the power of the Holy Ghost, through your word. And we'll give your name the praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen? Amen? Oh, my God. I, 
Ooh, I almost got some of that time back. I think.